from Talking Boats, one of the big topics of conversation at Boot Dusseldorf is that it's been three years since the last show. But now we're back, pacing the 17 halls that make up this mammoth show. And it's clear that a lot has changed since the world went offline. Design has taken a big step forwards and frequently where you might least expect it. Of course, the reality is that while we were busy communicating through our computer screens, the world kept spinning and projects carried on. We just weren't there to witness them. So now that the curtain has finally been raised, there's stacks to look at at the world's biggest boat show. Take Dutch builder Safir, for example. Gone are the modest traditional lines and in comes a range of very cool looking day sailors. This one, the Safir 24 Lite, is designed to operate off-grid. It has a solar panel on the foredeck to charge the battery for the torpedo propulsion unit and a masthead nav light that's solar powered. It's got instruments that you take home and charge with a USB cable. I know that's not fully off the grid, but you get the point. Perhaps the most amazing thing though is that this is the prototype and has yet to be sailed, but Sophia have sold 36 already. Or how about the Sunbeam? Back in the day, this Austrian company built solid but pretty ordinary looking boats. They're still well built, but look at this. Ordinary? I think not. Then there's the Bente 24 and 28, a pair of sporty looking day sailors designed by Judel Vrolik. Look at what Jeunet are up to with their Sun Odyssey 380, or Dufour's new 37. Alain are here showing off two models, the E6 and the Impression 43. And so the list goes on. And it's not just boats with keels. While windsurfing is still a thing, as they say, wing foiling is now a big deal. And stand-up paddleboarding just gets bigger and bigger. And that's what makes this show so special. From surfboards to super yachts, it's an incredible showcase for water sports. There's even the world's first powered lilo. Or perhaps you prefer a personal submarine if you've got half a million euros to spare. Dusseldorf is also where the European Yacht of the Year winners are revealed, and that's where I'm going to start. Not all the winners were on show here. In fact, just one of them, the Beneteau First 36. She won the Performance Cruiser Division, and this is a fascinating boat, because on the face of it and alongside fairly radical style boats, it looks, dare I say it, a little plain. She doesn't even have a chine. What's going on there? But look a little closer, and this is a boat that could reset the performance cruiser racer market. On deck, it's pretty straightforward, but underneath the flat, beamy sections below the waterline and the slender section rudders give the first 36 the look of a much higher performance boat than her looks on deck suggest. Which also provides one of the best clues as to why the builders claim that this boat hits eight knots upwind and has been regularly clocking up 15 to 20 knots downwind. For a boat of this type, that's extraordinary. Obviously, I now want to go. Below decks, the first 36 is a very simple wipe clean type layout. Little to write home about. But move around the accommodation and you'll see that she's very well proportioned, with no frills or fancy bits to get in the way. Plus, she's even got a chart table. Just as you thought, they'd gone out of fashion. A basic price tag is just under 240,000 euros, ex-fat. In the luxury cruising category, it was the Oyster 495 that took the award. This boat wasn't at the show. Instead, it was the 595 that was the focus of attention. But we ran a major review on the 495 in which we took her offshore for three days. The link is above and in the description. If you haven't already seen it, take a look. It's a very, very interesting boat. And if you fancy a 495, as well as needing 1.35 million pounds, you're also going to need to be a little bit patient and join the queue because the next delivery slot is November 2024 and that will be hull number 18. Enough said. Meanwhile, if you want to know more about this boat, the 595, well, we did a test review of this boat as well. Check that out with the link above and indeed in the description below. 
Now, when it comes to the other boats that were winners in the European Yacht of the Year that aren't here, no problem, because this man, my former colleague and good friend Toby Hodges, is one of the judges and sailed all of those boats. So, Toby, thanks for joining us. First of all, tell us about the Linjet 39, which because that won in which category was that? That won the Family Cruiser category. So yeah, that was up against the Benta 28 and the Duval 37. So very diverse category that one. Um, and got to be honest, most of us hadn't heard of it. I hadn't heard of it. No. Yeah. Where's and it yeah, built? It's built in Sweden and it's a 19th century yard, 1886, I think. And the brand itself is 50 years old, fifth generation boat builders run by three brothers. And you look at it and you think, well, it's quite a classic, traditional looking boat with its raked stem and that sort of thing. And um, yeah, every, each and every one of us was 12 judges and we were just all sort of blown away with how well it sailed and how well it's built. Really? Yeah. It's amazing that that's managed to slip under the radar when it's been around for so long. It's not like we're strangers to Sweden, is it? It's just bizarre. I know, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And does it, I mean, when you talk about it being a Swedish yacht, it conjures up images of Herbert Rassi, Nyad, Sweden yachts, and all those boats that made the Swedish brand so famous. Does it, it's in line with all of that, is it? In ter yeah, in terms of build quality, absolutely. And um, it's, as you know, that a lot of those yards do a lot of in-house as well. Uh, and Linjet specializes in that. It designs, engineers, builds, and then maintains its yacht. So it's got facilities there for over 200 winter storage Linjets. They've built 900 boats. Um, so how you and I haven't heard of it, I don't really know. Yeah. But we have now. Yeah, excellent, good. Well, that was a great winner. Uh, can you remember what the price tag is for that boat? Uh, yes, it is approximately 385,000 euros. Right. So it's a lot of money, um, you know, for a 40 footer. And it's not the most voluminous boat, but it's built very, very well. And I should also mention that you might have heard of Shogun. Yeah. Um, carbon epoxy boats, and they build those. Which oh, really? are sort of other end of the spectrum, very high performance sort of racer cruisers. So they've got some skills. Right, yeah, it sounds really interesting. Okay, so talking of volume, the other category, multi-hulls, who won that? Nautitech 44 Open. And that, an interesting category as well. We had seven multi-hulls, which we initially split into family and performance. Um, but there was so much crossover between them, um, and some fell in both camps. And we discussed it for a long time, as you can imagine. <laughs> but when you, I think a lot of people look at multi-hulls now, it, it's that you're looking at that compromise between space and, and performance. And it, it's that ratio and getting that right, and that's what Nordtech has done really well. It's Mark Lombard design, nice fine entries, fine holes. I think you've sailed a couple of these mm. Nordtechs in the past. They've got the aft helm, direct steering, and I think certainly myself and the other judges really appreciate coming from monohulls, stepping on that, you really feel you can enjoy the performance of the boat, sailing upwind and obviously, uh, and maintain good speeds off the wind as well. But mm. it's a uh, yeah, really good mix, I'd say, for, for family fast cruising. Okay, and finally, there's always a special award. Was A, was there one this year? And if there was, who won it? Yeah, there's a special yacht category, um, which is very, very loose. I mean, we had a scow in there, plywood epoxy scow. We had a tra trailable trimaran. Uh, but it was won by Echo Racer, which is um, this sort of startup Italian group of friends who wanted to basically do a proof of concept. They wanted to make a prototype that showed you can build a fully recyclable boat today and a high performance one. So it's, it's a garage project. They, they started with an Optimus, they made that, and then they got Matteo Poli, the oh, Italian yes. designer, Grand Soleil, that sort of thing. Um, he drew them this very contemporary, cool looking sports boat, 25 foot. Uh, they built it and went out and won the ORC Worlds in their, in their class in Lake Garda. So wow. they proved it on that side. But yeah. really good, fun performance boat. We couldn't give it the overall award because it is just a prototype. But in the meantime, they've designed a 30 footer, which they are, their company's called Northern Lights Composites and they're going into production with this 30 footer poly design again. Um, and yeah, it's, we were all sort of really happy that they're showing, you know, there are a few yards that are doing this sort of thing mm. and using these materials. Um, 
but to do it, put it out there and to show the big yards it's possible to do this yeah. um, was a yeah, really positive thing. It's interesting, thing. isn't it? Because here at the show this year, there's been, well, Beneteau have definitely done it. There are several other companies that are talking about using resins and, and talking about the afterlife of boats, isn't it? Absolutely. It feels like it's going to become more and more of a, of a thing. Yeah. The thing that makes me, I wonder though, is that that's all good and it's great that we're going in that direction. But actually, when you look at it in real terms, they're talking about an average, or when there's an average life of both sort of, I don't know, 25, 30, 40 years, you think, so that's the point at which we're going to be using this technology later on. And you do sort of wonder whether things will have moved on in another direction, but it, it's an odd one to crack, isn't it? It's an odd one to crack, but I think that the thing that's really changed for me here is they've been talking about it, mm. but now they've actually brought it. Yeah. You know, it's been, there has been quite a lot of greenwash come by, by yards over the last few years. And they say that they're, they're using bits of, of sustainable materials here and there and that sort of thing. But, you know, as you say, Beneteau have brought a, brought a boat here. They've proved they can do it. And if the biggest yard in the world are going to do it, and they are going to bring that about, a recyclable boat, and that's not going to be an option, they're going to build it on their small geno straight away. Um, I think it's, it's really encouraging because, yeah, at the moment we don't know exactly the process they'll use for breaking those boats up but at least they can separate the resin from the fibre and they can build a new boat with it. And I think that's the goal of anyone doing, building anything sustainable, is to do a circular loop with it so you can build the same product out of the same materials at the end of life. It does so. make you wonder whether people, when they're trading in their boat, they're probably trading it in to take the resin out to go and make their next boat. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's sort of, you can sort of almost see that chain working. Don't you? Absolutely. So boats coming in feeding the chain at the other end that actually produce the resin for the new boats. That... Well, we see it in cars and I think if you can, um, if you buy a boat and you know that at its end of life you might then potentially trade it in for a new one and, and could be encouraged to do it rather than scrap it, then um, yeah, it could be it could change the industry a bit, really. Yeah, good. Brilliant. That's a really good insight. Thank you very much, Toby Bear. One last thing. You've been here for a few days like me. What has caught, is there one thing or, that's caught your eye at this show? I think Rather than catch my eye, that was the thing that I've really noticed is is the focus on not and it's it not it's not just electrified hybrid systems that sort of thing. It's actually materials as well. And that's that's really nice to see. Yeah. Good. Right. Thanks very much. See, I told you he'd know. That's why we got him on. Aside from the European Yacht of the Year winners, here's a few of the other boats that caught my eye this year. Starting with the Genoa 55, which is my standout boat of the show. The reason, the concept and its execution. This is a boat that's been designed around what they call 50-50 living. 50% outside, 50% inside. It's a really clever new approach. And I spoke to her designer, Philip Brion, about what was behind the thinking. 50% of the length of the boat is for the inside, 50% is for the outside uh, space. Uh, giving this, uh, it offers a lot of new possibility to, uh, to, set, um, to, to, uh, to accommodate uh, the outside space. And uh, we use this opportunity to have uh, uh, three zones. And uh, one is uh, a, a new center cockpit, it's new for this uh, kind of boat. Uh, and uh, we had um, put some uh, functionality which used to be inside in this area, like navigation, like a breakfast table. Also the uh, guest cabin and uh, companion way of those guest cabin. So in this way, we have a crossroad in the middle of the boat, fully protected, and uh, it leaves uh, open a lot of space forward and aft. Forward, uh, this uh, is uh, to the advantage of uh, the owner uh, space, owner cabin space. So become one apartment, a cabin more uh, galley, more uh, another uh, city. Uh, so this is huge compared to uh, most of the uh, boat of this size. And the same thing aft, we had a lot of space available, free of uh, any maneuvering. Uh, we use uh, the full beams of the boat to make a, a very large, let's say, cockpit, but uh, I would prefer like a terrace uh, with direct access to the water and two big tables, which I think is the area where the living on board uh, will be mainly. 
let's say I am a sailor. You know that I have done a lot of racing boat and I've uh, steered my boat uh, a lot, fast nets, uh, the ton cup, uh, you know all this story. And so I, I am maybe one of the designers having spent most of, much of time in steering the boat, in cold, uh, in, uh, in raining, in, uh, in fast net conditions. Oh, you've been in England a lot then. Yeah, I am so in fast net, yeah, sure. So, uh, so um, that's anyway something I like, but uh, I, I wanted to, to keep this uh, a nice feeling of uh, steering a boat, uh, but with the possibility, added possibility to, to be protected when, uh, when you like. So uh, the ideal position for me of uh, steering the boat is a midship. Uh, why? Because it's uh, centered. Uh, and um, she give access to um, the winches and maneuvering, which actually have been designed very close to the Elsmans, but also is the best position to, uh, to look at the sails, because this is where the boat is a beamer, and, uh, and you can push you uh, um, outside, uh, most of uh, outward, and then uh, you have ideal view on the jib as a, on the main sail which is, I think, uh, uh, does not look like with this canopy, but actually is uh, even a better position uh, on this boat than uh, any else, um, which uh, traditionally have the steering aft. And a more comfortable place to be as well for the yeah. motion, isn't it? Because you're in the motion middle of the Motion and also uh, easy protection, because if you have a wave coming, uh, you can still move <laughs> and to protect yourself. I'm liking it already. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but th this is, uh, of course, I pay much attention to all of our design. Uh, although we, 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 we like to, uh, to, to give uh, this um, feeling of uh, villa on the beach, uh, we still uh, are always very concerned to keep uh, a performance and, uh, and this enjoyment of steering a boat. There are all kinds of other details as you sort of drill down and, and have a look at the boat. One of the things, another thing that struck me is when you look at the side decks down the side, how they slope down. And it's quite a subtle detail, but it means that the whole of this cockpit area here can actually be lowered down. So you don't get a great big towering bit of fiberglass and high freeboards and the rest of it. It's very cleverly thought out and it really does seem to work. And as you can see, it's already a very popular boat indeed. Dutch builders Contest were showing a pair of new 50-footers, the 49CS and the 50CS. Over the years, this company's range has got slicker and slicker on the outside, and on the inside, if you haven't been following their development, you'll barely recognize them. Interior designer Wetzels Brown worked with Contest on these models, and they're very impressive. But when it comes to layout and style, for me, I prefer the 49CS with its owner cabin forwards, just where it should be if you want peace and quiet when moored stern too. And two very comfortable twin cabins aft, which would also make great sea berths. Plus, they can be converted into doubles if you want. But another interesting aspect of both these boats is that they're available either with fully electric or electric hybrid propulsion systems. Contests have teamed up with electric experts Torquedo, who have used a marinized version of the 40 kilowatt hour battery that's used in the BMW i3. If you want to go fully green, you can use the prop as a hydro generator while sailing or charging at the dock overnight. Or if you're not quite ready for that, you can go for the hybrid system that uses a generator to charge the batteries. Right, let's go back to one of those boats that I mentioned in the introduction, the Sunbeam 32. She's extreme on the outside and fascinating on the inside too. This is a boat that, as I say, comes from a yard that in the past was really quite traditional and quite straightforward, but they have really changed their look over the years. This, first, this boat was first launched in 2021. It's a good example of another new fascinating design that happened pretty much under the radar that was caused by the global pandemic. She was designed by Gerald Kiska, who, uh, if you know anything about KTM or Atomic or many other big brands, you'll know that his company, his design, his industrial design company, has been responsible for some very interesting work with some major, major brands. And this is part of their work. She's aimed primarily at the big lakes in Europe and she's been designed as a weekender. Uh, it's all electric, as you might expect for something that operates on the lakes where fossil fuels are in general banned. 
but she's more than that. She's very, very innovative. And one of the first things you notice down below is the space and the visibility, not least of all, these windows, these hull port lights in the bow that allow you to see forwards as you're sailing. So not only just the nice view out the side, but actually see where you're going. And that was a conscious decision by the design team. And I must say, <laughs> clearly we're at a show, we're not on the water, but you can see how effective they would be. The other thing that you notice is that there are no bulkheads in the boat, apart from one underneath the cockpit there, but no bulkheads. And the strengthening and the stiffening is all behind these surfaces here in the hull. So it creates a very, very open, spacious feel. It's an all electric boat. It comes standard with an eight kilowatt uh, battery. It's an electric hob. Everything is electric. It has the ability to be charged up from the dock if that's uh, where you're keeping your boat or there is an option to have an integrated solar panel that goes into the deck. You can have various configurations there for people that don't have a berth with shore power but have their boat sitting on the mooring so the boat will charge up whilst you're away ready for your weekend trip. Throughout the boat there are lots of sort of clever details from the uh, helm positions further aft with the twin wheels and with all the control lines, <laughs> what few there are, coming back to the helm station to allow you to sail this boat very easily single-handed. But from the outside at least when you walk past her the thing that really just grabs your attention is this flare in the deck. It was completely deliberate, they call it the flight deck and the reason it's there, well it's twofold I'm told, one was to create more space on the foredeck so they could have another living space, sunbathing area with cushions and the rest of it, on board what is essentially quite a small boat. That's been very effective and apparently the other reason was to actually provide some protection in waves so you haven't got waves crashing straight over the top. that would be interesting to see how that works out. But it is a fascinating boat. I'm really looking forward to having a go on this one. It's really very innovative and refreshing to see it. So what's the catch? Well, I don't know, having not sailed one yet, but I suppose one of the things that might draw a little bit of breath is her price tag. For a 32 footer, she starts at around 200,000 euros, 219,000 actually to be precise, ex VAT. And I'm told that by the time you put various other optional extras and paid the tax and the rest of it, you're up to about 300,000, which is up there for a 32 footer, but it's very different. So there we have it, just some of the things that caught my eye here at Boot Dusseldorf 2023. It's a remarkable show, it always has been, it's giant. 17 halls, each one of them about the size of one of the halls at XL in London, if that gives you any idea of the scale of it. There is so much to see. I barely even, or didn't even get time to touch on the rise of the foiling powered boards, the surfboards, there's loads of those around now. The development in adventure ribs, there's that submarine, I mean, it's just endless. So what about that Lilo? The manufacturers call it the Emat Jet. Essentially, it's a powered inflatable chair with a drinks holder. It's easy to operate, they tell me. You just sit down and steer using the hand controller. Looks good to me. So that's it from the show. But we also picked up a number of interviews with key players whilst we we're here, which will be rolling out soon. So there's plenty more to come out of this spectacular show. But for now, Alfie the Zane. Thank you.